Okay. Well, then I'm, I'm stumped talking now. Off, off you go. <laughs> Cheers. All right, we're starting, are we? Yeah. Officially. <laughs> cool. So, uh, hi, everyone. Um, I'm just going to have a scroll through, see who's here. Uh, there's a few people I know. Hi, Russ. Trevor. Sarah. Nice. Nice. I won't say hi to everyone because we'll be here all day. But um, hello, uh, let's, uh, let's get started then. So um, this, this workshop is going to be primarily about uh, tunings, so alternate diatonic harp tunings, um, in particular my own wild tuning. And I'm just going to give you a bit of background basically on how, first of all, why I developed this tuning and how I got there and some of the other tunings that I came up with along the way. Um, so yeah, feel free to jump in and ask any questions as we go. So um, it started really, um, I played Richter tuning for, I don't know, 10, 10 to 15 years before, before I made my own tuning. And um, as I kind of, uh, start to move away from playing traditional bluesy stuff and play more blues rock and then hard rock stuff. Um, I started to get more and more frustrated with standard tuning um, for a couple of reasons, really. Um, first of all, I play guitar as well. And these days, most of my influences are uh, guitar players or singers. Um, I don't really listen to a lot of harmonica anymore. Um, so there are certain things that you, you hear rock guitar players do all the time that just aren't possible on standard tuning. Um, so uh, most people like to play in, in second position most of the time, myself included. Um, I do play in several positions, but I think we, we can all agree that second position is the most versatile and it's it's the sound that everyone thinks of when they think of you know blues or blues rock harmonica that kind of so um so for playing in second position the things that have always annoyed me are first of all the octave above your root note so your root note is draw two and your octave above that is obviously blow six. And because that's a blow note and it's not able to bend, it's not very expressive. You can't scoop up on it like you can on a down on hole two. And you can't get much vibrato on it like you can down here. Because it doesn't bend, and vibrato is a, a movement in pitch. So that always annoyed me, because on the guitar, you, you're always kind of hitting that, that octave with a lot of uh, vibrato on it. <laughs> so I wanted to, to change that. Um, the other thing that, that frustrated me, and probably frustrates you as well if you're a blues player especially, is that in second position we don't have a minor third or a flat five in our upper octave. Right? So the, the minor third is the equivalent of the draw three half step bend. And the flat five is the equivalent um, of the, the draw four bend. So you, you don't have those notes in the upper octave, which, when you think about it, is crazy, given that this is primarily considered a blues instrument, and only two of the three octaves have a, a blues scale available in them. Um, now, obviously, you can get those, those two missing notes with an overblow in hole six to get the minor third, and you can get the... Uh, the, the flat five as an overdraw in hole seven. Um, but I know a lot of people aren't very comfortable with overblowing, overdrawing especially. Um, you have to set your harps up to, to really get them to sound good. Um, and I, I can overblow, by the way. 
um, I just choose not to most of the time. And the reason is, um, even the people that are really, really good at overblowing, like Jason Ritchie or, um, uh, why is his name just gone out of my head? <laughs> ja Howard Levy. Um, you know, they, they have amazing control of the overblows, but even at that level, it's impossible to get an overblow note to sing like that. It, it will never be quite as resonant. You won't get that degree of vibrato on it. So even if you can get those notes, you won't get the same flow to them as you can by you know having those notes available as a, a bend. So um, what, what I did with, with my tuning, um, was, uh, in fact, the, the first thing I did was I, I came up with this tuning that I call one, two, three tuning, <laughs> which is um, called that because it's just like holes one, two, three, and then one, two, three again, one, two, three, one, two, three. Um, so, I haven't played this up for a few years, <laughs> but you can get a full blues scale then. through all three octaves just with draw bands. Um, but I didn't really like this one, two, three tuning because um, you lose a couple of the things that are associated with blues harp. Like you don't have your four, five trill anymore. You get that instead of a, and you don't have your two, two and five tongue split and your four and five double stop way or so this tuning was kind of kind of cool but it, it wasn't really happening for me so then I came up with another one that I call four five six tuning <laughs> and as you can probably guess this is just like holds four five six four five six four five six four so this is to play in third position okay because um, holds four five and six are kind of the sweet spot for uh, third position, you've got a whole um, you've got a whole minor pentatonic scale there without any bends, and then you've got the draw six bend to give you that flat five to make it into a blues scale. So this means you can bend all the draw notes. Um, you've got your flat five and your minor third in every octave. But again, I found this one a little bit confusing um, and a little bit too precise and a bit too repetitive because you don't really have to bend anything on it you lose some of that bluesy feel you know but it's it's good for fast repeated patterns right? <laughs> because it just repeats all the way up you don't have that transition that happens at holes six and seven on a normal harp so I didn't stick with that tuning for very long either. Um, I did use it on my cover of uh, Jethro Tull's song, Locomotive Breath. Are you all with me so far? <laughs> Moving fast here, but cool, cool. <clears throat> so then I, um, I was watching some YouTube videos and I, I saw a video come up from Brendan Power. Uh, if anyone doesn't know who Brendan is, he's uh, primarily an Irish folk musician, I suppose, um, but he's, he's an inventor and uh, harmonica customizer, um, and he's invented loads of, loads of things um, to try and get around all these frustrations people have with diatonic harmonicas, um, like the, the missing notes or like the fact that you can't get nice vibrato on certain notes. So there were two tunings he's come up with loads of tunings by the way um paddy richter is is one of his um but he, he's got so many inventions it's hard to keep up with them all uh, but he had this one called the power draw and um with this holes one to six are completely standard <laughs> So you don't lose any of that bluesy stuff in holes one to six, which is great. 
And then in the upper octave, it becomes kind of like a repeat of the lower octave. So hole seven is like hole three, hole four is like, uh, sorry, hole eight is like hole four. So the stuff you do down here, you can do up there as well. So I really liked this. Because it meant, you, you know, you can get vibrato on a few more of the sort of key notes and you can, you can get your flat five as a bend and your minor third as a bend. There were a couple of things that still didn't work for me with this, though. Um, not to say that, you know, it wouldn't work for someone else, but um, it didn't fix the problem I had about blow six being a blow note. Because <laughs> blow six is still the same. Um, and his draw seven only bends a tone, so it doesn't behave exactly the same as hole three, because hole three bends a tone and a half. Um, so, yeah, so this, this was kind of almost what I was looking for, but not quite. Um, so Brendan had another tuning called the power bender, so that was the power draw, this is the power bender. Uh, so power draw changes from hole seven up, Power bender um, changes from hole five up. Um, now I haven't played this for about three years, <laughs> so I can't really remember how it's configured. Um, but with this, again, it, it was almost what I was after, but not quite. Um, this gives you a bit more chromatic capability without the need for overblows. It does address that problem I had with below six because he's made that a draw so you can get vibrato on it now but because of the way he set the blow note in hole six that draw six only bends a half step right so it bends down to a major seven not a minor seven like draw two does, and it's it's the the minor seven or flat seven that we want for blues. So this didn't quite work for me either. So um, these were kind of precursors to the the wild tuning that I use now. Um, <clears throat> so the tuning I've ended up with, and I've been using this pretty consistently now for about three years, I'd say. Um, so holes one to five are completely standard, so you don't lose any of your bluesy licks. You still got your trill. <laughs> but then hole six is exactly like hole two. So you can bend it a whole step and you can get a nice wide vibrato on it. Hole seven is exactly like hole three, so it bends up to a tone and a half. And hole eight is exactly like hole four. And then hole nine is like hole two again. And hole 10 is another idea that I nicked from Brendan, uh, which is to reverse the blow and the draw read in hole 10. So that, um, I call it the, the whammer jammer blow bend. is now a draw band rather than a blow band, which I think makes it easier to control. So any questions so far on any of that? I know I've just given you a whole load of information there. Are you losing any notes, Will? Sorry? Are you losing any notes? Uh, not really, no. Um, the, the only real sacrifice for me was uh, the note that you have in draw six. Um, you, you don't have that note there anymore. So that, that top note there, um, 
you haven't lost it completely because you can still get it as a whole step bend in hole seven. Uh, I, <laughs> trying to play it in the same key. I don't know what key that was. Um, so yeah, you still have it, but it's a bend now, so it's not. It doesn't sing quite as much. It's not quite as resonant and bright. Great. But no, you don't lose any notes. Um, you gain a few. Um, you can get uh, a major seven uh, now in the middle octave um, as a draw six half step bend, just like you'd get as a half step bend in hole two. So it's good for playing major scale in second position too. Um, and you can you can pretty much get a whole minor scale as well. You need one overblow for that. And you can get a harmonic minor scale there too. Um, but primarily, um, I mean, it's it's been marketed as a, a rock tuning, um, which is mainly what I use it for, but really it's a, a blues tuning because it's it's designed with the blues scale <laughs> with the blues scale in mind so um yeah and it's great for for any minor pentatonic blues scale stuff um it's really good for major pentatonic stuff too actually it just means that now again you can get vibrato on your octave and and in the octave above that And that little um, kind of country bend that you get <clears throat> when you're playing major pentatonic in second position, that, that kind of country uh, Charlie McCoy thing on, on hole three, you can do that an octave up now. So really, it, it, it's just given you a lot more expression um, and a few uh, more well, notes in the upper octave. Yeah. Well, the, you know the draw six on your harp. Would that be the? Would you get that on the road uh, sound? You know, on the tune um, on the road. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, well, the missing is that built into that six on yours. Uh, it's in seven. So oh, the, it's in the, seven. Right. Yeah. The, the missing note that he played in that solo on on the road again is is a minor third. Um, so. That'd just on, be a normal draw seven on your uh, bit. It's a seven half step bend, right, so gotcha. it's like playing a yeah. draw three. <laughs> Ooh. So um, I, I think he got that note a, a different way. Uh, I think you're right. He retuned his yeah, retuned uh, six, his draw or, yeah. six. Um, but with this tuning, you know, you've you've got that minor third, so it's it's good for for any you know anything in a minor key. Um, not yeah. not just for that that song. So yeah. Any other questions, Russ? Yeah, I just wanted to know um, what you've done with the Wamajama stuff. Other reads, other reads, just tuned differently. Um, I, I like, oh, I like, I like the blow whammy jammer riff. Uh, okay, you mean how how have I got that to be a draw yeah. bend now instead of a blow bend? Yeah, are they, are they yeah. swapped the reads over so it's not something I can tune out of it? Is it? You might be able to tune out of it. Uh, I have to think about that. Um, basically, the the reason why on on a standard harp. Uh, you see this? This is a standard C harp. So, in case anyone isn't aware, on a standard harp, you can only bend draw notes from one to six, and you can only bend the blow notes from seven to ten. 
And the reason that that happens is to do with the relationship between the blow read and the draw read in each hole. So if the draw read is higher than the blow read, that means that the, the draw note will bend. If the blow read is higher than the draw read, that allows the blow note to bend. Okay. And there's also a, a reason why different holes bend different amounts. And this is something that you have to take into account when designing a tuning. Um, it's not just about making sure you've got all the notes you want. You have to consider how much each note is going to bend. So in hole one, um, I don't know if you can actually see this, sorry. <laughs> but in hole one, we've got C as our blow note and D as our draw note. Um, if you look at C and D on the piano, uh, there's just one missing note in between those, one black key, um, which is a D flat. So this will only bend down to a D flat. It won't bend anymore. Hold two, there are two missing notes in between the blow and the draw. So that's why that has two bends. If you were to lower the, the blow note, a semitone, then that would allow the draw note in that hole to bend another semitone. Does that all make sense? Yeah. Cool. So like in hole five, we've got E and F and they're already only a semitone apart because there's no F flat and there's no E sharp. So that's why the, these diagrams show there's no bend in hole five. Um, but actually it does bend. It's just, it only bends half of a semitone. <laughs> so, yeah. I, I just spent, uh, you know, most of a year trying to get that Wama Jama thing. It's, right. in my, it's in my head now. And I've got to oh, right. And I've I've messed it up for you, have I? I've got to reverse it playing your your harps. And right. the amount of precision precision you need on that draw is, is, is phenomenal. Uh, yeah. On, I, on, the, on the vibrato bit, you know. That. Right. It's funny. I find it much easier to control as a draw bend, but that's just me. Oh, I'll, I'll stick at it. I'll stick at it. Cheers. Cool. Cool. Uh, any other questions before I move on? Oh, I see there's some questions in the chat. I didn't see them. Uh, is it a side or harp? Yes, they are side or harps. Um, it comes in two models. Uh, these are available from my website, by the way, if anyone's interested. Uh, so it's comes in the, the side or session steel and in the 1847. Uh, this one has a, a plastic comb. Looks like this. And the 1847 has a, a wood comb like this. Um, the 1847 is a better harp, in my opinion. Uh, they're, they're more airtight, a bit louder, a bit, bit more responsive. So they are about 20 pounds more. But um, in my opinion, they're, they're worth the extra. Yeah. Have you tried one of the Lightnings, Will? Uh, I haven't yet, no. I need to uh, get onto Lars at Sidon and get him to send me one. Uh, yeah, it looks a nice bit of kit, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, it does look good. I'd be interested to see if it if it sounds a lot different. I expect it, it sounds brighter. I think the idea is it, it's a bit brighter and a bit louder. Right. So everything's uh, polished. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? All right, I'll move. I'll move on. So, <clears throat> so that's wild tuning. Um, there's a couple of little happy accidents that happen with this tune in as well. Um, this is something that I generally find. I've made a lot, a lot of different tune ins. Um, and there's always one or two things that you find happen that you didn't necessarily anticipate. Uh, so with this, um, one of the things I like is that, uh, that chord there that you get as a draw two and five tongue split. Uh, it's giving you your root note in draw two and a flat seven above it in draw five. So you'll quite often hear blues songs end on that. And people use it when they're soloing as well. Um, so you've got a root and a flat seven above it. But on a standard harp, you can't play a root with a flat seven below it because that would require you to play a draw two and a draw two whole step bend at the same time or 
a blow six and a draw five at the same time, which is obviously impossible. Uh, but with this, you can do it by playing a draw five and a draw six. <laughs> quite like that it's got a nice uh, nice crunch to it <coughs> all right um, I'm just gonna talk a bit about some of the other tunings I use them <coughs> for anyone that's interested in, in getting into alternate tunings um, so people ask quite often how I manage to get my head around using all these different tunings and switching between one and the next and it's really down to, um, you, you have to think about how it relates to standard tuning because they all relate to it in some way. Um, people think that, you know, a different tuning is just a completely different instrument that they've got to relearn, but it's not really the case. So with my tuning, I think of it in terms of the whole numbers. So if I was going to write the numbers on this harp, I'd put one, two, three, four, five. Two, three, four, two, ten. Does that make sense? Because this is just a, a repeat of, of this. So one of the other tunings I like is natural minor tuning. Um, find one. <clears throat> so this is a, a natural minor in A minor. So this is basically designed to give you uh, a full minor scale or Aeolian scale in second position without the need of overblows. Okay, so um, you you would need a, a four overblow normally to get your minor six. That note there. So. <clears throat> Natural minor tuning basically just has two notes altered in each octave. All right, the the third is flattened a half step from a major third to a minor third. So, um, so draw three is your third if you're in second. So that draw three has been lowered to give you a minor third. Which is cool. So you don't you don't have to worry about bending it anymore. Um, sometimes I still like having it as a bend because because you can get you know a different sound out of it, a bit more expression. But on this, it's very precise, and because it's a natural note, like I talked about before, you can make it sing. It's more resonant than. A, a bent note. Um, so that means you get a minor chord now as your draw chord. <clears throat> so the other note that's sorted is, is the six. So below five has been lowered as well. So instead of right. <clears throat> So the good thing about this is you don't really have to do anything different. You don't really need to know any of the theory behind it. I certainly didn't when I started using natural minor harps. Um, they were the first alternate tuning I ever used. I think I'd only been playing about two years when I started using them. And you can take any licks that you, any kind of major pentatonic licks you normally play in second position. Okay, do exactly the same thing, and it comes out minor. Instead of major, which is really cool. All right. <laughs> so lately, I've been making a, a minor, a natural minor version of wild tuning as well. <laughs> <laughs> which I really like. Um, I think I've got one here, yeah. So this is just wild tuning, but with the thirds and six flattened. So. <laughs> which 
Actually, I like this a lot. Um, it's my new new favorite tune in at the moment. I may speak to Zydor at some point about releasing it as an official official thing. Yes, Russ. Will, do you glissando to, to anchor yourself on the harp and your... <clears throat> um, yeah, yeah I, I do a lot. Um, you know, is, is, it just, is it just to get to the note that you need? Uh, partly that, partly that, but mostly it's for... <laughs> just yeah. for extra you know um aggression and and drama you can hear it more more if i play through here <laughs> so instead of just coming in <laughs> It's, you know, it's got a, a lot more aggression to it. Um, again, that, that's kind of something that came from trying to imitate guitar players. Uh, if you think of someone like Gary Moore, he kind of just whacks the strings on the way up to the one he's hitting. I think you call it raking on a, on a guitar. But, uh, yeah. Okay, I think there's some more questions here. <clears throat> uh, I see, Russ, you've been answering the questions for me. Nice one. <laughs> yeah, what, what tools do you use to order the tuning of the stainless reeds? Yeah, one of those diamond tip engravers that Russ is holding up there is great. Um, the thing I use, it's, uh, it's like a Dremel. I think it, it's actually sold as a, like a, a nail file, but an electric one with a little revolving... Um, thing <laughs> that's like got like a bit of sandpaper around it and you can just use that um it's not that difficult to retune the harp actually um you just put put a thin uh like a metal shim under the under the reed that you want to work on so you don't mess up the the sides of the slot um and then you just file a little bit off the surface of the reed end to raise the pitch of the reed and you file a bit off the base end to lower the pitch of the reed well yeah the diamond tip engraver has got a little fine button on it right and it gives gives you much more control on the reed so yeah i can imagine that yeah that's great that the dremel dremel seems to jump all over the place that's it does a bit yeah <laughs> okay um what was I going to say? Uh, I can't remember. I can't remember what I'm saying now. Oh, yeah. Top tip. Um, this was a tip I got from Brendan, actually. Um, if you want to try out a little tuning idea that involves lowering the pitch of the reed. So if you wanted to try out natural minor tuning, for example, um, where you don't have to raise any notes, you're just lowering um, the thirds and the sixths, you can take a tiny... And I mean a tiny piece of blue tack and stick it to the you know the, the tip end of the reed. And the extra weight um makes the reed oscillate slower and thus lowers the pitch of it. Which is great because it, it does actually stay on there for as long as you want it to. I've got harps I retuned with blue tack years ago that are still working fine. And it's completely reversible, so you can you can always take it off if you want but yeah that that saved me a lot of time and a lot of uh a lot of money over the last few years just trying out ideas with, with blue tech <clears throat> all right i'm going to talk about one other tuning i think <laughs> so this this is another very simple one uh this is the the country tuning um and this is probably the most most simple uh alternate tuning because there's only one reed um not just one note but one reed on the whole harp that has been modified so um country tuning is designed for playing major scale stuff primarily um now a, a lot of you will probably if if you wanted to play a you know a major full major scale um, you would probably pick up uh, a standard harp and play in first position. Because you've got that scale nicely laid out there. The 
problem with that is it's not um especially if you're playing country it, it's not very expressive um because you don't have the bends in the right places and your root note is always a blow note so again no vibrato no scooping up from a bend on it so if you wanted to play that major scale in second position um this up really isn't set up for overblows by the way <laughs> Um, you'd need a five overblow to get your, your major seven. You got a minor seven in draw five, but you need an overblow to get the major seven. Uh, so second position isn't very good for playing a major scale for that, for that reason. So what country tuning is, um, draw five has been raised a half step to give you a major seven instead of a, a flat seven. So now you get that note that would have been an overblow as a, a natural draw note. So you can get a nice tone, nice vibrato on it. And you've still got all the, the, the sound of second position, that kind of rootsy, bluesy country. So, yeah. <laughs> so that, that's why, why I like alternate tuning so much. You know, it, it's not just about do I have all the notes available to me that I need for this song or this scale. It's more about how do those notes sound? How do they feel? How do you, you know, how do they flow in and out of the other notes around them in, in the scale? Um, yeah, a any questions to on any, any of that? <clears throat> well, have you got any tips for trying to play as fast as you do? <laughs> um, I'm, trying uh, to learn, I'm trying to learn that intense minor blues and struggling quite a bit with that. Right. Um, just slow it down it's on YouTube. Just and... practice. It, yeah. It's a case of slowing it down. Uh, break it up into little bits. So if there's a fast triplet, let's say, you know, then start it as, as slow as you need to. And then gradually speed it up. And, and learn it in all three octaves as well. Um, that yeah, that that's the tip I'd give because it's 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 good to learn every every lick that you learn. Try and learn it in all three octaves, um, and th that helps to improve your understanding of the the layout of the notes as well. Um, and scale practice is always good. <laughs> going down, going up. Um, and, and try and run all, all three octaves. <laughs> run all three octaves together. So you might have to start it. Start it slow and then gradually start to build it up. Um, and whenever there's two or more draw notes in a row or two or more blow notes in a row try and do those in one keep them connected in in one breath that helps a lot with playing fast uh but yeah it is just just practice repetition um i think most people don't realize exactly how much repetition it takes um it takes hundreds of hours <laughs> like when i started playing i didn't have a job and I, I came out of college um and pretty much the whole time as a college i just stayed in you know in my flat and played harp for about eight hours a day and then i left college and couldn't get a job so i stayed in and played harp for about 12 hours a day for a year or two uh <laughs> 
And that's it really, but just a, a little lick that might seem quite simple. I've done that like thousands and thousands of times to get it to that point. Um, so it's just breaking it down, slowing it down, and uh, just keep keep doing it over and over. Annoy your wife and your neighbours. Yeah. <laughs> I think having a bit of uh, OCD or like ADD helps as well. So <laughs> cool. Uh, any other questions? I think there's some in the chat here. One from Ben. Uh, for tune and still reads, uh, it's a rotary tool. Yeah, nice. Polishing wheel, which is easier on the reeds. That's a good idea. I never thought of that. Cool. Cool. <clears throat> any other questions about anything Anything else heart related? It doesn't have to be to do with, uh, with tuning necessarily. What keys are available in your wild tuner? Uh, yeah, good question. Um, so the 1847 is available in the most common keys. So A, B flat, C, D, and G. Um, I found that having a standard E and a standard F was a bit too high and squealy. Like this is a standard E. <laughs> it's just a little bit too high. <laughs> uh, so. The session steel comes in A, B flat, C, D, low E, low F, and G. Um, the low E's and low F's are quite nice because um, the top end isn't too uh, piercing and it's still pretty easy to control the bends. <laughs> and you, you've still got... Still got some nice kind of chords and, and chugging at the at the low end as well. <clears throat> yeah. Did you know did you know Seidel are offering that tuning in a lightning now? I got a Are they? I got oh right, they didn't tell me that. No, no I got a, me a message back from Ben. Oh cool. But I'd oh, already bought bought it from your website. Right. <laughs> well Will, can you tell us the story about the advert you did on the telly? How how that come about? Uh yeah, sure. Um well I do I do quite a lot of session work behind the scenes um in this studio here and that particular advert there's there's some guys i know who i don't know what you call them really like a, a sync agency i guess um and they they got a request um basically the the, the company put put the word out that they want a track in a certain certain style for an advert and there's, there's a brief and everything given uh and then this uh agency got in touch with me and asked you know asked me to come and play harp on it and um they were local actually so they came here and we did it in the in this room um but yeah that was it really we, we had a brief and they were like y you're gonna be a cat <laughs> you're gonna be a cat uh, try and sound as cat-like as possible. Um, I usually ask for some kind of reference track with, with sessions like this. Um, you know, because if someone says they want harmonica, you don't know exactly what they've got in their head. It could be Little Walter, it could be Sunny Terry, um, or it could be someone else. Um, and the, the reference track for that particular advert was uh, Bring It On Home by Led Zeppelin which I actually covered in my band uh, a couple of years ago. So, yeah, I just just try to give it some of that and try to make it as cat-like. Yeah, it was a, it was a cool, it was, All that yeah, stuff. It was a cool little lick, yeah. And, uh, well, I hope they paid you well for it anyway. It's yeah, it, was, it was all right. It's all right. The money's not that good for that kind of stuff anymore. Really? You know, oh. it's, always, it's always just a one-off. One-off fee, but... Um, oh. Yeah. yeah, I just uh, I did a session recently for you guys probably wouldn't know him because <laughs> he's sort of uh, electronic dance music. A guy called Diplo, uh, he's a producer, and um, there's a song called Do Si Do that came out a couple of weeks ago, and I, I played the harp on that as well. It's just like uh, 
Tá caro. Just really simple, really simple kind of loop. But that's quite often the way with sessions, you know. Um, so as people... regards to advert, that every time it's played, you don't get... It was just a one-off fee. It's not done get. on a royalty basis for that no, stuff. No, no, no. It's, it's, it's nearly always a session fee now. Right. Uh, yeah. yeah. I'm cool, sure. thanks for that. No worries. Um, question from Trevor. Are Wild Tune Harps labelled in first position? Um, yes. Yeah, they're, they're labelled the same as, as standard harps. So, yeah. So on an A harp, blow one is A. Draw two is, is E. <clears throat> and they are designed to play primarily in second position, but th there's no reason why you can't play them in, in other positions as well. <clears throat> All right. Um, any more questions? If not, I can uh, just do a bit of bit of playing. Bit yeah. Of what sort of uh, what sort of uh, modern players do you like listening to? Well, do you sell personally heart players? Um. I don't know, really. I mean, I like I said, uh, I don't really listen to uh, to any harp players. Um, guys, I I like you know I like um, Roly Platt, uh, player from Canada, very good melodic player. Uh, Jason Ritchie's great. Um, uh, I don't know for for more traditional stuff. Uh, I like Paul Lamb. Um, uh, you know, guys like Rod Piazza and. Uh, uh, Todd Parrott's a, g a great player for someone a bit different. Again, kind of very melodic. Um, I like stuff that's that's original and d regardless of style, you know. I like John Popper from from Blues Traveler. Um, you know, nobody else sounds like him. Um, and I, I like, you know, I'm mainly into songs and and songwriting, so. I don't know if it's just overexposure where I've been playing the blues circuit since I was sort of 18, but um, I'm not often impressed <laughs> by people playing over a 12 bar anymore. Um, right. Just because I've heard it, I've heard it all so many times and sorry. And, and everyone's been playing over the same chord progression for, you know, 70 odd years now. Um, that pretty much all, all that kind of blues stuff, no matter how good it is, it, it's it's all been done, and and I'm not really interested in that. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Cool. But yeah, there's there's plenty of good players out there. Um, I really like uh, Elin Erberg, who I collaborated with recently. Um, she's in a, a band called Among Links, and. Uh, they're a great band, really good songwriters, really good arrangements and great vocalist. And, and the harp is, um, she, she plays really good parts, well thought out parts that contribute to the arrangement. Um, and she, she plays hooks in the songs and that, that, that's kind of what, what I'm into now. No. I used to be like a blues, kind of blues purist. <laughs> I was into all, all the old Chicago blues stuff, and I, I still am. I still am. But um, for modern players, I, I like to see them do something a bit, a bit different. Well, yeah. It, I, I play almost all my harps are half valved. Okay, uh, cool. Because I'm a, a big fan of P.T. Gazelle, and yeah. I, I play He's a lot a of player. melody, melody tunes in in a church worship setting. So, right. you know, I need the missing notes a lot. Right. Um, and uh, can you say anything about that at all? Um, not a great deal. Um, I do have one. I don't know if this is half valved or. Yeah, this is this is half valved. Um, I did look into valving a few years ago before I started messing around with tunings. Uh, it wasn't the answer that I was looking for. It it works really well for for PT Gazelle and his style, but the 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 problem for me with with valve bending is the bends aren't as strong. You know, it's it's not like a, 
it, it's more like bending a note on a chromatic. Um, you can kind of scoop on the notes. I mean, if you were a bit better and, and used to using valves, you could probably do it better than that. <laughs> but the, yeah, it's, it's good for kind of scooping into notes, but um, it, it doesn't really work for my more aggressive style. But if it works for you, that's great. You know. Thanks very much. <laughs> Cheers. So, Will, um, yep. there was a second part on the, the question now. Which oh. um, octave splits are, um, are sort of available or not available on the wild tuning? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I'm trying to find it. <laughs> I've got about a million harps here. Um, yeah. So, one and four, obviously. Two and five. Um, then, what was the blow three and six? You can still get, but that will now be blow three and seven. So you have to block out three holes. Um, I don't really use them ab above that, um, but you, you could get six and nine would be an octave. Uh, uh, yeah, blow and draw. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd have to think about that a little bit. <laughs> Even on standard tuning, I only really use tongue splits up to all six most of the time. But... Yeah, I'm trying to get those five splits at the minute. so <laughs> Right, yeah, they're tough. They're tough, aren't they? Thanks. <laughs> no worries. Will, most, most of your wild tuning is on the draw. Yes. Um, how do you balance your air? Uh, as um, to the Richter, Richter mm, sort of method of playing. Yeah, um... Yeah, it's, it's only the fourth degree of the scale that is a blow note on this. Um, I don't know, really. It's just having a good good tone. I think the answer is I don't use a lot of air to play. Um, so I practiced being able to hold draw notes for a very long time. So... <laughs> So that sounds like I'm really laying into that note, perhaps, because you know, it sounds a bit aggressive, it's got some vibrato on it. But the, the volume and attack doesn't come from using lots of air. Um, and it, it's kind of the same with, with singing, if any of you are vocalists. Um, the, the volume comes from resonance, building up good resonance, which means playing around with your mouth shape, and you know, keeping keeping everything relaxed, so the sound can resonate. Um, and that's it, really. I just don't use a lot of air. And if if you can practice holding draw notes for for that long, however long that was, thirty seconds or so, that's longer than you'll ever be drawing for in in a song. Um, and then when you do hit a blow note, you I've, I've noticed watching videos back of myself, this bit of hair here. <laughs> Sometimes flies up like this when I'm playing. Um, so I'm, I'm maybe getting rid of some extra air by perhaps tongue slapping the blow notes when I hit them. That lets you dump a load of air quickly. Um, and glissando in. I think I'm upside down. Because I'm sliding up to the blow note. I'm getting rid of a lot of air on the way to it. So yeah, that, that's another, another way yeah. around it. That, that's how I started to learn is listening for where the breaths were. So right. Yeah. Listening, listening for, to your wild tunings, especially right. on that third position song that you've done. Cool. Um, you know, when you are on B flat where you hold the note for absolutely ages. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, that, that's kind of uh, where that question came from. Cool. Cool. Just on that, uh, Will, um, yep. with regards to what I tend to find, you know, if I'm mainly playing uh, draw uh, notes and then play the odd blow notes, I always use yeah. that blow notes and my nose, you know, sort of blow, yeah. blow through my nose as well, you know, to... Um, yeah, absolutely. You can do that. Um, I think I probably do that. I, I don't do it consciously, but... Um, and you hear guys like Junior Wells as well going... <coughs> 
on their blow notes, that, that kind of <coughs> cough sound, which is forcing a lot of air out quickly. Um, and, you know, you hear guys grunt and sort of groan uh, in the gaps between phrases, which it's, it's kind of easier to expel a lot of air quickly sometimes if you vocalize for some reason. I, I don't know why that is. But. Yeah, I think there's um, a Jason Ritchie album, is it Down at the Duke? from about right. 2013 and you, you can just hear him grunting all the time when i first heard it i thought oh yeah what's going on there <laughs> right yeah i used to overdo it as well there's a song of mine called paranoia and it's like between every phrase ah! <laughs> just notice there's a, there's a question there from chris pickett asking what a valve is uh yeah so a, a valve um it's like a wind saver on a chromatic um so it, it closes off uh over the the top of the the reed um to stop air escaping um and it, it allows single reed bending um usually when you bend a note on diatonic both the reed the blow and the draw reed in that hole come into play to make that bend happen but if you put a valve in there um it prevents prevents that and and it allows you to to then bend that blow note which wouldn't normally bend uh but it's it's just a single reed bend like like you get on a chromatic so it's not as strong and it it, it won't bend particularly far um so that's probably not the best description of it but <laughs> i'm uh <clears throat> not not big into valves as i said cool well um, are you, are you going to do another european blues thing once everything settles down uh, yeah, I, I definitely. Um, there's one confirmed for November. As far as I know, it's still going ahead at the moment. Um, yeah, for anyone who doesn't know, there's uh, the, the Euro Blues Foundation is run by uh, a, a blues artist called Michael Roach. Um, and they teach, it's an acoustic blues weekend the one in november uh they do an acoustic blues week in the summer as well and uh you you come and you, you stay on on site um and every day there's a full day of, of lessons with the weekend i think it'll all be with me but on the week there's usually four or five different teachers you usually get someone in from the states um it was going to be the guy from the the nighthawks this year but it got cancelled obviously due to the the virus um but it's it's not just harmonica there's country guitar classes and slide guitar classes as well and then in the evening everyone gets together and jams and there's a student concert one night and uh a tutor concert another night so it's it's really good just just to you know keep your playing up and just hang out and jam um it's the only tuition i've ever had on harmonica was when i was 16 i went on a blues weekend and i went on a blues week and i had some instruction with eddie martin and uh yeah so the only only tuition i've had <laughs> was from that that week so um yeah it, it certainly served me well uh so i'm lucky enough to be uh teaching on it now as well so yeah check that out if, if you're interested it's uh, euro blues i can i can vouch for the uh the challenge of the day Right. I went to I went to the last one and it uh, it got me certainly back into my passion for harmonica again. That's great, awesome. It was a bit challenging, but there you go. Yeah, well, you know, I like to uh, work people hard. <laughs> cool. Um, any more questions before we uh, finish? I think we're wrapping up soon. <laughs> no. Yeah. I'm going to say it was a, a an observation here. I mean, I was going to ask you the question about you know how does your mind cope with switching between the different tunings but then I, yeah but then i thought well actually you know i i play in you know first second third fifth position yeah. and i was thinking well probably what your answer is is will you just get used to that you, you, you your brain goes into a different um that's it that's it yeah um also if if you understand why you're using a particular tuning so like with the country tuning i talked about it's just the the minor seven has been raised to a major seven uh so usually if i was playing 
major stuff in second position, I'd stick to a major pentatonic. <laughs> ah. Um, but because on the country tune in draw five has been raised, I don't have to avoid that note anymore. Um, it's, it's another note you can use. So you don't really need to know the theory behind it. You just know that, okay, I'm playing, you know, major pentatonic, but, oh, I've got an extra note there that I can throw in. <laughs> Which totally changes the, the tonality and the character, um, as opposed to just playing the pentatonic scale. Um, I, I think that's a good thing to do, you know, just, just introduce one new note <laughs> at a time. Um, I've been playing with the harmonic minor scale recently, which is quite a new scale for me. I've never really explored it. And it's the same as a natural minor scale, but it has a major seven in it instead of a minor seven. So... more of a, an Eastern European feel. <clears throat> but again, it's just one, one note different, so it doesn't, doesn't take too long to adjust to it. <clears throat> yeah. All right, then. Um, Any I other think... questions, anyone? Yes, Will. Can you... Yeah. Are you Try Parisian? To... You're Parisian. What was... Uh, did you use your own tunings? Uh, no. I know you told me on an email, but was it oh, your right. own tunings? Uh, it's fantastic, it's... actually. Thank you. Um, on that, it's a, a standard C harp and an A minor harp held together with this little magnet. Uh, yeah. And the reason for the two harps on that, again, it's it's not to do with... Um, you know, not having all the notes available because all the notes are available on one or the other of these harps. It's to do with how those notes sound and where the vibrato is. So um, that first phrase... Uh, sounds good on this harp because the, the big note at the start... I can get you know, as a draw note with, you know, that's bendable, you can get vibrato on it. You can hit it as a double stop to add some extra grip. But then the next phrase, yeah, it sounds all right, but the first note there is now a blow four, so I can't hit it with that attack. And, you know, this is a Gary Moore song, and he's a very, very intense blues rock guitar player so he wouldn't be hitting that note like that so i chose to play that phrase on on the c harp in fourth position because it lays out well and then the next two notes i could play on the c but can't get much vibrato there so I jump back up to the top. So I'm, I'm constantly switching harps from one phrase to the next on that. <laughs> Trying to make it so you can see. <laughs> <laughs> So, thank you. Yeah, so it's, you know, you, you could play, I'm playing a natural minor harp there in second position and a, a C harp in fourth position. Um, so it's, it's using the, you know, the natural minor scale, which is available on both of those harps, but certain phrases sound better on one harp, certain sound better on the other. And, um, 
you know i i used to think when i started using two or sometimes more harps on a song that um you know people would think it was kind of ch cheating and i should just learn to play it all on one um but i don't see it that way anymore um it's you know at the end of the day it's, it's music it's about what it sounds like and if you can make something sound better by playing it on two harps than it, it does when you play it on one then uh, you know I, I don't see a, a problem with that so yeah <clears throat> well what scales do you use the most is it major and minor pentatonic um yeah being from a, a blues background um it's blue scale second position blue scale without a doubt <laughs> Even when I'm playing rock. <laughs> it's still the same scale. As I'd use playing blues. Um, so yeah, minor pentatonic, blues scale. Um, I use major pentatonic a lot. <laughs> And, and the, you know, the, the minor scale, recently the, the harmonic minor scale. Uh, I really like uh, Phrygian, Phrygian dominant. It's great for that kind of uh, Middle Eastern, dark Middle Eastern sound. I like that scale a lot. <laughs> well, do you prefer uh, stick mics over over a bullet mic? Yeah, de definitely. Um, I've always found them just more more comfortable. I suppose my hands are fairly small, but um, I d just the position of holding them, well, rather, I, I don't know. I feel very cut off from the audience in front of me with a with a bullet, large bullet especially, and the way the cable comes down out the bottom is just a bit uncomfortable to me when when i'm trying to perform so um yeah i, I find these better for just the grip and getting a, a tight seal and yeah. and hand techniques too um i just use an sm58 standard vocal mic these days um low impedance as well uh most harp players obviously use high impedance mics into uh some kind of you know fender or fender based valve amp um more recently i'm using mesa and and marshall amps um which are very high gain amps um and then using a, a low impedance mic and and getting the drive from the amp rather than from from the mic uh it just it works better for the for the rock thing certainly um and i find you can when you've got that really high gain sound it's almost like the heart plays itself <laughs> you don't and you you don't have to use as much air either to to you know to create a sound and to cool yeah 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 sorry you're using a low impedance mic without a, a, a transformer without a that's right cable. yeah just right. completely okay. completely standard sm58 uh like you'd find in any in any venue on the on the stand yeah, yeah. Would, would, no yeah, yeah, yeah. You might find though, if if you try this setup, low impedance mic with high gain guitar amp like a Mesa or a Marshall, uh, you will most likely run into feedback problems when you come to do that live. Um, the the there are ways around it. Um, uh, right now, actually, I'm not using the real Mesa right now. I'm using something called an Axe Effects, which is a digital uh, modeling rack unit. Um, so it, it's modeling the sound of an Axe Effects and it, it, uh, of, a, of a Mesa, and it's very, very close. Um, you can get it to, to do any of the Fender amps, any of the Marshall amps, anything you want. Uh, and, you know, I, I've got a Fender Bassman and a Super Reverb, and the models of those amps in the Axe Effects, I can't really tell the difference in the way they feel or, or the way they sound. 
so what I'm looking to do soon um, is to use the Axe Effects live with in-ear monitors so there won't be any harp anywhere on, on the stage. Uh, so therefore I can have as much volume and as much gain as I like uh, in my in-ears uh, without any chance of feedback. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. So, yeah. Hopefully that comes out all right. So, Hopefully, yeah. If you're, if you're leading the band, no one that causes problems with the rest of the band not being able to follow you. Uh, well, they'll have it in their monitor mixes yeah, as well. Um, having it coming out of the drum monitor or the monitors over there it shouldn't cause feedback problems unless they've got it seriously loud. And I don't think they're going to want me that loud in that monitor. So, <laughs> yeah. Will they get a choice? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank Will, you. Is that the effects rack that Mark Ford used to use? Isn't it? Uh, I don't know what Mark Ford uses, to be honest. The, the Axe Effects, it's, it's a Fractal Audio Axe Effects 2. Um, a lot of metal bands use them for guitar. Um, I think Steve Fai has one. Um, a lot of guitar players use them. They are expensive. Um, it, it's the very top end of of digital modeling. Um, it's not like if you bought a, a like a, a Boss uh, effects unit or a Line Six or something that sort of sounds like the real thing. Um, Axe Effects are at the t the top end of, of of that. So they're a, a couple of grand. I think they might be three grand new. And it's a lot of money. A lot of money but but they you know they're great and they've got millions of pounds worth of amps and uh <laughs> effects pedals modeled inside them with boutique amps and everything so uh to me it's worth it sorry will what was the name <laughs> yeah. of the company that makes that uh, well, i'll be buying it <laughs> fractal audio how um, reactive fractal Fra oh fractal yeah fractal audio um, they brought out the Axe FX 3 recently, so my Axe FX 2 uh, is probably worth about £1,000 less now. So uh, you can have a look on eBay. <laughs> Will, how do you practice with that? Can you plug it into your interface? Can you? uh, at the moment, it's, it's plugged into my interface. Um, so there's no sound in the room at all. Um, but I've all got right. the sound of a cranked amp. Um, so you've got that going into your interface, into, into the interface, PC, and then out, out to the headphones. headphones. Right. Uh, so if you just want to practice, you don't even need the interface. You, there's uh, a headphone out on the on the front of the oh, front right. of the right. unit. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's, just, it's a cool thing. Have you actually got a set in there that you use your favourite setting, or do you just a bit of reverb and? Um, yeah, I, I play with it all the time. Um, always a bit of reverb and a, a bit of delay. Uh, I'm only just getting into GarageBand. Just discovered, uh, right. you know, I can get a sound into my computer as well as a back. Yeah, you, you can get some great sounds even even on GarageBand, like just with the the amp, uh, you know, the amp models on there. Have you tried Amplitude? No. Well, I've run Logic and oh, and, so. and with the Axefax as well. I don't really, you know, I don't really need. Yeah, other, you don't, other plugins, you don't need. So. Yeah, that's right. Okay, okay. thanks. No worries. Oh. Okay. Um, should right. you rock it up there, well, you've um, you've been talking for you know you probably need a cup of tea or something. Right. Like um, I mean, one of the I think the take home messages that that you know for me is, and it's something I do, but is is experiment, um, and that's exactly what I think you've demonstrated that you think well actually, you know I I will dem I will experiment in different positions. Um, mm. but not as adventurous as you, you know, ch changing the tunings. But I think it, it, the fact that you've gone from tuning to tuning, and then you finally got something that works, yeah, in the context that... you're using, I, you know, I, th I think that just demonstrates, you know, everyone should have a um, should experiment, play around with things. You know, you can play the same tune, but you can play that in different positions, um, using different tunings. Um, That's it. So I think. I mean, what you've, I mean, it's a break, the, the brain dump you've given us, I think is absolutely brilliant. <laughs> really, really enjoyed it. Yeah, I, mean, I think people, it, it, when people want to get outside of, of just playing traditional blues um, and play more melodically complex stuff, they, they, you either have, well, you have three options. You can switch to chromatic 
or you can go down the overblow route like Jason or Howard Levy, or you can go down the tunings route like you know like myself or Brendan Power. Um, for for me, I'm I'm convinced that the tunings are are the way forward for this instrument. Um, yeah, I I love them. I love them. And uh, my my whole style has changed massively since since coming up with this tuning. It just means all all the ideas I've had in my head for so long I can now you know play. <laughs> so that's exactly that's exactly how I felt about getting your wheel your tuning. Kind of made kind of made sense to play second position in the second octave. Awesome. You know, without wind direction changes and all that. Yeah. That's same it. licks. Same licks is an amazing concept. Both yeah, side, both sides. Same lick, same muscle memory. So, if you just got time for one last question, someone's yeah, of course. Said, so. um, what harps did you use for the Gary Moore? Uh, uh, so, Gary Moore Prison Walkways is an A minor natural minor harp, um, which side or label their natural minor harps in the second position key yeah. as the Lee Oscar. Hona don't apparently <laughs> just to confuse things so an a minor natural minor harp is basically a d harp with some of the notes flattened on it uh and then a, a standard c harp which i play in fourth position to get to give a minor yeah. okay well, I, th I think we better let you go now before uh, any, right. any, any further questions come in <laughs> so on you know on behalf of everyone and harmonica uk that's Absolutely brilliant. It's been really, um, you know, really good hour and a half nearly now. So oh, thanks. Uh, so thanks for joining and thanks everyone else for joining in. Um, next week, it's back to chromatic Adam Glasser and Sam Spranger. And then I think the week after that, we've got Richard Gems back on the diatonic. So it's um, all good stuff. Great. Okay. Well, um, thanks. Thanks again. And see you cool. soon. Thanks, Sam. Thanks everybody. Cheers. Good to see you all. Have a good weekend. Yeah. Take Cheers. care. Thanks, Thanks Will. Cheers. Thanks, Will. Cheers, Thanks. guys. Bye.